So welcome to Chat GPT and the future of everything. Today, uh, we're excited to have everyone here. And it looks like based on the chat that I'm seeing, there's a lot of people here uh, ready to learn. Uh, and we're excited to go through the materials we have to help everyone do that. I'm Dino, CEO at Prescouter. Let's start with why we're here. So for over a decade, we at Prescatter have been helping the world's top companies address their innovation challenges. And even though in all that time, we've not seen a technology generate the buzz that ChatGPT has been generating, we're also a little kind of frustrated that the mainstream information really does not paint the picture of the, the vast opportunity that we have here. Um, and we're a little worried that some people may missed the boat on this one. So what we've done is in the same way that we put together teams of subject matter experts from around the world, both internal to pre-scatter and external, uh, we put these teams together to address technical and business challenges that our clients have. In, in the same way we put those teams together, we put together this panel that we think will help start to paint the picture of what this opportunity really is. Um, so first, we have Dr. Charles Wright coming to us from Australia, who'll give us a sense of what's possible through some practical examples. Second, we'll have uh, Sundar Raman from Chennai in India, who'll take us under the hood and dispel some of the magic. Uh, Manoj uh, Bapat is coming from Austin, Texas, and he'll give us a sense of the, the roadmap that companies can use to think about this technology. And then lastly, Dr. Marianne Krish from Brazil to give us a case study of how we're actually applying ChatGPT uh, within Prescouter. And I'm coming to you all from Chicago. So before we get started, I also wanted to highlight who's here today. So we have uh, a lot of folks from kind of products, kind of manufacturing style companies, we tend to be the, the core of the type of clients that we work with. But we also have uh, a number of people from other industries, such as finance and uh, HR and other things. Uh, in terms of seniority, we have a really great influential group. Uh, these are the folks who re uh, registered. Uh, so there's directors, VP, C-levels, um, and a number of other folks here as well. Uh, so a lot of people, a lot of great people, a lot of influence. Uh, and something that I want to kind of keep in mind is that we sent a survey out as everyone registered, asking them about their experience with AI and this kind of large language model AI. And so given that uh, most people have only experience from ChatGPT or no experience, we have tailored this presentation and the content we're going to go through mostly around this audience. But I think there will be something for even those who are further along or ad ad more advanced in their understanding. So uh, I I'm excited for what we are going to be sharing today. So with that, let's get started. We're going to jump in with Dr. Charles Wright, who, who has been leading a lot of the efforts at Prescouter to really leverage AI and figure out how it can be applied both uh, within Prescouter, but also for our clients who are covering a broad range of industries from pharmaceuticals to glass manufacturing to uh, food and beverage. So Charles, what, which company functions, which departments do you think are going to be affected by chat GPT and generative AI? Uh, well, the short answer is uh, almost every a business function will be impacted by generative AI. A tool like uh, ChatGPT provides an interface that uses natural human language. So the barriers to use are very low, but it can expose external data from the internet and internal data from an organization, software and other digital tools. So the opportunities are really vast and can touch on um, every functionality. Okay, so can you, can you show us an example of Kind of how this tool could be used? Yeah, for sure. So to get started, um, 
show you what the interface looks like of ChatGPT for those who are not familiar. Uh, when you create your free account and um, sign in, you are presented with a screen like this um, that at the bottom says, send a message. This is what we call the prompt where you provide some text or instructions to ChatGPT, get a response back in a conversation-like format. So as an example, uh, let's walk through um, uh, the case where um, I ask uh, ChatGPT to play the role of a senior executive at a food company looking to expand its range of dairy products in China and, and ask it, what are some strategies to enter this new market? Um, so when I hit enter, immediately ChatGPT replies with uh, a list of, of several different options from conducting market research to partnering with local companies, uh, product localization, building trust with consumers, leveraging digital channels such as social media, uh, investing in a strong supply chain and focusing on uh, innovation. So a range of different options. Um, and let's say that this third bullet point around product localization, we'd like to learn more about this. Um, so we can then send a follow-up message and ask what are the unique tastes and preferences that Chinese consumers have when it comes to dairy products? Um, and again, when we send this query to ChatGPT, it uh, immediately responds with uh, a list of several uh, different uh, examples. Uh, so these include uh, texture, uh, smoother texture, less strong flavors, uh, products that are mildly sweeter, uh, products that have some specific health benefits that are compatible with traditional Chinese medicine. And it also notes um, some differences in the consumption of dairy um, in general. Uh, let's dig further into the second bullet point around sweetness to, to better understand uh, this one. Uh, so uh, we can ask for a list of dairy products that are mildly sweeter and more popular in China than other parts of the world. And uh, when uh, we send this uh, question now to ChatGPT, uh, we get another list now of even more concrete examples of uh, specific products, including uh, those with sweetened condensed milk, flavored yogurts, uh, milk teas, uh, fermented milk, uh, milk candy, and ice cream with different exotic flavors. Uh, so in this example, you can see that uh, I was using uh, ChatGPT initially as a, sort of a collaborator to brainstorm ideas and to help, um, help me think about the problem. And then digging deeply into one specific area that I, I didn't know as much about, I, I could use it to conduct some very quick targeted research to, to learn more about um, the options here. That's great. So, you know, you walk through an example of how, you know, some folks in the leadership roles might utilize this kind of technology, but what about kind of on, on the in a manufacturing floor, it, more technical work that's more everyday. Are there use cases of chat GPT in this context? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, definitely. So I can walk through an example here. Uh, in this case, um, I tell chat GPT that uh, we collected data on different process parameters at our factory to identify causes of manufacturing defects. And I ask it to play the role of an analyst exploring these data. Um, and, and request uh, a computer script in Python language that can detect outliers and in, in some data that's changing over time. And in this case, uh, ChatGPT immediately responds with uh, a Python script uh, that is uh, well documented and that is supplemented with an explanation of what the code is actually doing, as well as some suggestions for which parameters I would like to change. Uh, the response that it gives is uh, a perfectly reasonable way to, to detect outliers, but it's not actually the best way to do this for something that's changing over time. So I come back again and I, I ask it to repeat the response, but this time using a model that I choose that I know will fit the data better. Uh, and I also ask it to make me a graph using some visual preferences that I have. Uh, and uh, again, when I send this query to ChatGPT, it immediately responds with a complete Python script uh, with the uh, data and explanation. It, it made a, a small set of fake data here. Uh, I gave one more follow-up and asked it to generate even more fake data over say 12 hours of our hypothetical process. And then I copy pasted the code directly into Python. 
Uh, I'll tell you, it did not run the first time. Um, I had to spend a few minutes debugging, uh, but then uh, in less than five minutes, uh, I had out uh, a working graph like this showing that the, the code worked, um, identified all the outliers in our, our uh, fake data set. And so this shows you how uh, even in something that requires a higher degree of technical expertise, uh, ChatGPT can be used to uh, accelerate uh, the workflow. Uh, in this case, um, you know, it, it again was sort of serving as a collaborator because I understood um, the tools, understood what I want to get out. I was able to be much more efficient at my work. And so I hope you can see from this example how it could be applied to uh, different types of uh, questions. Right, right. So, you know, we walked through a, a couple of hypothetical kind of examples, but are other people out there right now and kind of applying this to industry or looking at this? What does that look like? Uh, yes. Uh, so I'll walk you through two examples of this from uh, two very recent academic publications assessing the uh, capabilities of chat GPT and um, two very different um, industries. So the first manufacturing. Uh, uh, this, this paper looked at the use for additive manufacturing optimization, uh, that's 3D printing. Um, and the researchers um, provided code for 3D printer that was not really that great uh, to ChatGPT um, and, and asked it to optimize the parameters. Uh, so in this case, you see on the left-hand side, the, the input, uh, which resulted in this product on the, the lower left, which uh, has uh, a lot of visible uh, defects, uh, and asking ChatGPT to read the 3D printer code and um, optimize it uh, resulted in a response with a dozen of very concrete suggestions for which parameters to change. And feeding those back into the 3D printer re resulted in the product on the lower right-hand side that has no visible defects. Uh, so in this way, the entire process of optimization was significantly accelerated. Uh, the next, next example comes from healthcare. Uh, in this case, the researchers were looking at the ability to use uh, ChatGPT uh, to optimize uh, clinical decision support workflows. This is basically like a decision tree within a, a clinical setting uh, of how to deliver care. Uh, this gives you an example on, on this slide. So on the top, you have uh, list of uh, criteria of immunocompromised patients who are going to receive a live vaccine order. And on the bottom, uh, ChatGPT generated some exclusion criteria for patients who should not um, receive this. And these type of results were reviewed, uh, were provided by AI, as well as a panel of human physicians, and then reviewed by a panel of uh, experts. And um, and the results looked overall very similar. Almost half of the suggestions made by ChatGPT were accepted by the experts. Uh, so this is um, you know, behind the number of human-generated suggestions that were accepted, um, but um, it's still vastly superior to previous approaches. And I hope you can see that even in a domain with a high level of technical expertise, uh, where critical decisions are being made, there. Uh, there could be a place for something like ChatGPT to, um, to make people's uh, workflows more efficient. Okay, that's, uh, that's interesting. So beyond ChatGPT, are there other AI models that we should all be aware of? Uh, yes, there are a few other um, approaches using generative AI. I'm going to focus here on image generation, which is the most mature example uh, after text. Uh, so the interface you see here is from Midjourney, which is a tool to generate uh, a complete images from a small text prompt. Uh, and I can walk you through one use case of using Midjourney for uh, packaging design. Uh, so uh, let's say we give a prompt here uh, for uh, tea packaging with some specific uh, visual parameters, um, a cool color palette, high contrast, refreshing, feng shui, right? Uh, we get out uh, Im uh, immediately four different uh, AI generated images that are of uh, very high quality. Um, and to give you an example of what this could look like in a complete workflow, um, 
uh, I'll show you uh, an example from uh, a graphic designer who used uh, Midjourney to create the images on the left, took uh, inspiration from one of these designs to create uh, a tea packaging here using the standard workflow within Adobe Illustrator um, and uh, reported a significantly faster time to creating the final product because of the ability to um, rapidly iterate over designs um, using uh, Midjourney. And then uh, after this, um, I'll just show you quickly a few examples of how this could also be used for um, product concepts. So uh, here are some completely AI-generated images uh, of a perfume bottle. Um, a concept car. A tennis shoe. A waffle bowl dessert. Uh, a Herman Miller inspired lounge chair. And uh, a loft kitchen interior. So, you know, to me, all of these examples are very, very impressive. So uh, it makes me wonder, you know, if we can have these AI models coming up with strategies for how to enter China, how to find defects in manufacturing processes, create product concepts. Are we, are we going to be out of a job? How, how does this, how do things look? Uh, not quite yet. So the technology is very powerful and um, it serves as a very um, power, potent collaborator, but it has its limitations. And I'll illustrate one of those with this prompt where I asked it to give me some patents that describe how to build quantum computer. Uh, and when I send this query to chat GPT, it again immediately responds with uh, a list of five different uh, US patents that uh, sound pretty reasonable. It use words like qubits and control circuit and error correction. Uh, so this all sounds reasonable, but it's unfortunately all fabricated. Uh, these patents exist, but they're on completely different areas. The titles for the patents are not to be found anywhere. So um, and this illustrates some of the caution that has to be used with the tool. And Sundar will talk uh, more about where this and other limitations from JetGPT arise and uh, what can be done to overcome them. Okay, great. So we've um, kind of walked through some examples, but we also wanted to kind of crowdsource from the group. We there are a number of people here who have been using ChatGPT. Do you have any favorite prompts questions you've asked it that you know you're willing to share I've opened the the chat up if you'd like to uh, put in anything that you found to be interesting use cases for you and while we do that uh, I'll also share some examples so last week I was actually talking to the CEO of a trucking company and they employ uh, a number of people whose English is not you know the best and so he's having all the that stuff actually generate their emails using chat gpt so now all of the that staff is producing really great looking emails um also as talking to someone who uh, had previously looked at how um insurance claims for example could be uh expedited um especially the more dis descriptive kind and um they think that there's a big opportunity here to use language models such as this to uh, expedite those kinds of kinds of processes. Um, so we see a few examples in, in the chat: improving emails, right? Tech, checking technical writing, grant proposals. Um, we do that is an example that we thought about including here. Um, writing C sharp. So yeah, there's kind of a lot of examples. Uh, thanks everyone who's sharing. I'm going to be closing the chat in a moment, but I'll end this kind of section by just giving everyone, we've kind of given everyone a lot of, lot to think about, but if we're to boil down uh, kind of the real, the real problems that chat GPT and generative AI solve that are not already solved by other tools, really it's kind of threefold. One is you know, often, uh, often 
there's kind of this blank page problem. When you're creating this first draft of a document, whether it's an email, whether it's a business plan, or whatever it is, there's kind of a big hurdle to overcome. And um, chat GPT and this technology really allows us to get to that first draft quicker for us to iterate on it. Secondly, it also, as we saw, acts as kind of a collaborator for thinking. Um, so you can kind of refine your thinking. And then lastly, uh, uh, as we saw with the, the Python script, uh, 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 finding defects example, it does make uh, technical work more accessible. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to know as much about coding, for example. And it's also important to know that this technical work could also be just writing English or any kind of uh, other things uh, that to some people may be uh, more technical. So as I said, I'm going to close the chat now, and we're going to um, jump into the second section where we have Sundar. And Sundar has been building AI models for self-driving cars, uh, but he's also been uh, digging deep into the academic papers that have been published, both by OpenAI as well as Google and others, uh, on how this technology works. Until recently, a lot of the way in which a lot of this technology was actually kind of out in the open for everyone to learn how it worked. And so we, we can actually discern a lot of information about what's going on under, under the hood. So um, Sundar, is this real intelligence? I mean, what we've seen is very impressive. What, what do you think? Do you know, this is a frequently debated question. Have we really designed intelligence? One can argue that ChatGPT is not intelligent enough for few real world scenarios, like the ones Charlie shared about the patent example. But I think we have found a very good recipe or framework for the path to develop general intelligence. There's a lot of smart engineering that happened under the hood to bring ChatGPT to life. And some of the papers that you just saw, the previous slides were pivotal foundations for it. Let's try to understand this by contrasting it with the traditional programming paradigm, one that we all might be familiar with. Suppose you want to code a calculator using the traditional software development approach. During design, you code, add, subtract functions, you create data structures, class objects, etc. While during use, the user leverages your logic program to perform arithmetic. But now, let's assume you want to teach the machine to learn arithmetic, but not explicitly program the logic as we see here. How would you go about doing it? This problem is fundamental to designing intelligence as we don't want to explicitly program every scenario for every domain, but rather let the intelligence system learn itself. Enter the neural network paradigm. Here, during training, you feed large and large of input output data, which is used by the model to find patterns in the input to predict a desired output response, and thereby learning to generalize. As you can see in this example, we feed lots of mathematical expressions at the input side, like one plus two, and their corresponding solutions at the output side, like three, to help the model learn arithmetic. The architecture used to achieve this learning system is a neural network, which is shown on the right. Now, at the top level, a neural network weighs different inputs iteratively to learn from data in an n-dimensional space and adjusts those weightings to predict the output better and better as time progresses. During use, it shows signs of intelligence by performing well, even on data, which is unseen during its training. In this example, despite training the model with just one plus two equal to three example, it learns to answer two plus two, which it wasn't actually trained on. I hope now we get a sense of this new neural network paradigm, often coded as software 2.0. This is all good, but the real practical bottleneck when trying to build a chat GPT-like application system, some amount of input output data that one requires. To train chat GPT, one needs an enormous amount of chat, question answer pairs, language, arithmetic, logic, and several domain specific input output data. For example, in this slide, a human needs to annotate or find values for the input math expressions, like one plus two, to obtain the output of three manually, which is required to be fed to the model as input and output pairs. This task becomes really difficult when trying to generate large language data, particularly at scale in terms of both time and money. Enter the generative AI paradigm, where instead of curating a labeled input output data, 
you just fetch large data available from sources created by humanity like from the internet books wikipedia etc this data size was around 570 billion words for chat gpt this new approach trains neural network by masking some elements of the data and feeding them as input and asking the model to predict the masked element as the output. For example, instead of a human having to label 1 plus 2, you just pick up the expression 1 plus 2 equals 3, which probably is available online somewhere in Wikipedia, for example, and you mask some element of it, like 2 in this example, and you feed 1 plus dash equal to 3 to the model as input and ask it to fill in the blank with the correct answer, which is just the masked input, which is 2 in this example. In this way, you don't need human annotators or labelers to find output for each input, but rather you just use the input itself to generate an input output pair. This way, the model learns the structure, syntax, semantics of the task broadly. You later fine tune it with small amounts of chat or other instruction following data to align it to be more helpful, honest, and harmless. Similarly, using this mass language modeling approach, the AI learns arithmetic, grammar, human language, knowledge, etc. As shown on the right, from learning through lots of data that the cat sat on the mat has a higher probability of occurrence than the cat sat on the mat, the model learns grammar. Similarly, learning to predict cat for the dash sat on the mat, it learns that the cat is a terrestrial animal while well a whale isn't. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, particularly, this slide shows the emergent capabilities of these generative models with just increasing model size. The number of parameters below each of the tree depicts the number of connections in each of the neural network. A model with 8 billion collections shows, shows some question answering arithmetic language understanding capabilities. Moving on, the bigger model, the one with 62 billion, shows some more capabilities like summarization, common sense, reasoning, translation, etc. Even further, the 540 billion parameter shows even more capabilities like reading comprehension, general knowledge, logic inference chains, joke explanation, etc. Just for context, ChatGPT is a 175 billion parameter model and a human brain consists of 100 trillion synaptic connections. As we observed, we're just scaling up the model size, but just using the same mass language approach as we discussed and with similar model architecture yields emergent capabilities. At this point, one can draw similarities between this trend towards increasing model size for more capabilities to the past trend or decreasing transistor size for more compute and how these two fields fundamentally change the world as we know. Right. So, so there is kind of, a, kind of a, a synthetic intelligence that exists in these models. Uh, are, are there any limitations to these models and, and to what they can do? Yes, Dino. ChatGPT is not a perfect silicon intelligence, as one might conclude from the examples we have seen so far. It still has quite some limitations to overcome, which we'll see. Let's start with this brilliant example, which despite being simple, illustrates many pitfalls of ChatGPT. Let's query it with a simple question, number of countries starting with the letter B. On a simple Wikipedia search, one can find that there are four countries starting with B. After knowing that ChatGPT was trained on almost all of the internet and has been amazed at by millions of people, one might think it's an easy enough question for it to answer. But as you can see in its response, it fails to provide the correct answer of four, but hallucinates and provides two as the answer. Even though the data of all the countries is there in Wikipedia, which it was trained on, it picked up this association for a query with two. We think this is probably due to some conversation which happened somewhere in the internet probably a Reddit forum, for example, where lots of users were debating that the number of countries started starting with letter V is two, and the model got biased from being trained on the data. What we can observe from this demo is that ChatGPT doesn't always provide knowledge grounded responses to questions and might give factually inaccurate answers by hallucinating. It's not able also to perform aggregate inferences, which is counting in this example, on the data that it was trained on. It's probably not yet an expert on all domains as it's lacking in geography, as can be observed through this example. But let's not lose hope on ChatGPT, just based on these examples, as its capability are like a toddler now. Let's try to think of some ways to provide some assistance to ChatGPT 
to help it accomplish this task. Let's try directly feeding an URL, which contains the list of all countries. For example, let's feed in this Britannica URL, which contains the list of all countries, as you can see, starting from the letter A, all the way up to the country starting with the letter Z. Let's feed this into the chat GPT from interface. And when we press enter, we see we almost get a similar hallucinated response as earlier, where we get the answer to be four, despite the correct answer being two. This doesn't work as it doesn't actually fetch the contents of the website, but just considers the words of the URL as normal conversational words that we use in our daily conversations, and tries to generate a response. As we saw, ChatGPT currently is a purely text input output machine where it just takes in input text and provides an output text response and doesn't treat URLs uniquely, which it should. Another obvious drawback is that its training data is restricted to the year 2021, and hence it won't be able to answer any questions pertaining to events post 2021. Through these examples, you can see how ChatGPT might hallucinate on many other critical business applications that you might use it for like chemical formulations, customer sentiment analytics, etc. And how we are left to validate the source of truth yourself. So, so, so are there any ways to overcome these limitations that this technology has? Yes, you know, there are a range of possible solutions to overcome these drawbacks. Starting with the quick fix, which can be achieved through just copy pasting the required data. So let's just copy the list of all the countries which is present in this Britannica site, starting from A to Z, and let's paste it in the ChatGPT prompt interface, along with your question. You can see here that you don't actually even need to clean up the data that you're copying. It could contain some other irre irrelevant data that is not required to answer the question. Now let's press enter and uh, Check what happens. As you may have guessed, finally, ChatGPT gives the correct answer of four to a question. It's able to do that now because it pays more focused attention to the words in its prompt and uses its arithmetic capability to count the number of countries and provide us with the correct answer. This way, ChatGPT can be made knowledge grounded. The system interactions that we saw are explained in this diagram. When you prompt the ChatGPT application along with your query and the contextual data, the ChatGPT AI model at the back end is able to pay better attention to the data at hand and provide an accurate response, again, through the application interface. But when you think about using this approach in a practical scenario, whenever you ask a question, you also need to spend considerable amount of effort and time in fetching the relevant contextual data to ChatGPT to focus its attention on the relevant information and make it knowledge grounded which is very inefficient and defeats the very purpose of using ChatGPT. OpenAI is also aware of these issues and has started to add extensions of plugins capability to enhance the ChatGPT interface through which it can access and interact with the external world. Let's start with the game changing plugin or extension, the retriever or lookup engine, which fetches relevant contextual information based on a query from various knowledge sources like Google or Bing search, open source data, proprietary data, et cetera, and feeds it into ChatGPT AI model along with a query. In fact, this is how exactly Bing Chat works. Let's see the demo. The latest Bing Chat feature released by Microsoft, which is pulling many of Google search users towards Bing, uses a lookup engine to find relevant information for our query. For example, if you type in the same question we have been asking so far into the Bing Chat, We can observe that the Bing first searches for the information using Bing search API, which it even shows, as you will see now. It is searching for the list of countries starting with V and obtains relevant context to answer your question and feeds all of it to ChatGPT AI engine at the back to obtain the correct answer of four for a query. This way, the manual process of trying to find relevant information to be fed into ChatGPT by us, as discussed in the copy pasting example is automated through the lookup extension. This way, organizations can connect internet data, their private databases, et cetera, to chat GPT engine and get knowledge grounded, factually accurate information from the application just yes, requiring it. 
Yeah, so so we're using this kind of countries example, but really this could be you know food safety plans, it could be FDA regulations, it could be patents, it could be any number of things that are kind of augmented with this technology to get the kind of more the responses that we're looking for. Is that right? There are several other plugins that OpenAI is actually working on. And let's look at some other useful plugins. One useful plugin which we wanted to mention here is the Open Table plugin. If you're looking for a restaurant which hosts particular food type in a particular place, a vegan food and San Francisco in this example, using the Open Table plugins, which is a real time online restaurant reservation platform, ChatGPT goes ahead and searches for relevant restaurants based on our needs and gets back with a link which you can just click to book our table. Really amazing, isn't it? With a plethora of other plugins on the way, ChatGPT can really help automate a lot of our tasks in different facets of our life. If ChatGPT was the iPhone moment, then in the AI landscape, I support for plugins to ChatGPT will be the after moment and is going to be really revolutionary. Finally, we can even fine tune these base AI models like GPT-3 or ChatGPT using our own proprietary data or any other public private data sources that you want the model to learn about. We can fine tune by training the model only on few topmost layers or by adding new layers to bring in new capabilities. Through this fine tuning approach, we'll end up with a domain specific custom model, like for example, a finance GPT or a chat doctor that has a better understanding of our data than a plain vanilla chat GPT model. One crucial point to note here is that it gets more and more expensive as we walk through the solutions from the easy fix of just copy pasting to using the lookup engine to finally fine tuning our custom model. So, so Tim in the audience asked whether, you know, we can use confidential internal company data um, with this technology. So is that possible through these approaches? Yes, you know, as I was explaining through the, uh, the example of a retriever or lookup engine approach. So one might have the data secured and probably allow the retriever engine to query the database to find relevant contextual information that they want to feed into the chat GPT engine along with the query. So of course, how you host the database, which is going to contain all of your proprietary data and how you're going to index it, which is something where you convert your data to numbers, which is used for similarity search, is something that we need to customize and make it secure in such a way that ChatGPT or OpenAI wouldn't probably be able to use your data for their training approach or basically your data remains same. Okay, great. So I kind of, we went through a lot of detail here, but essentially, I guess the main thing to know is there are some limitations with the technology, but these can be overcome to uh, kind of solve the business kind of cases, issues that uh, we want to solve. Uh, and with that, we're going to transition to, to Manoj, who's been uh, leading kind of AI products from IBM Watson to Charles Schwab to now in telehealth and has a broad range of experience for how these technologies can be applied. So Manoj, based on kind of your experience of what you've seen, how, how do you think, you know, you know, the leaders here who are kind of interested, curious about this technology, how, how they can, how can they go about thinking about leveraging this across an entire organization? Uh, thank you, Dino. Great question. So I think uh, there are lessons that we have learned uh, historically, whenever any new breakthrough technology comes about, along with the lessons that we learned in the context of the AI world pre-chat GPD. So if you could please go to the next slide. Uh, and the answer or the success historically has always been at the intersection of process, people, and technology. And I'll get into a little bit of the details for each of these. So next slide, please. So keeping those fundamentals in mind, uh, every organization, when it comes to the adoption of data, when it comes to the adoption of AI, will be on a spectrum, will be on some part or some path for that journey. And so 
what worked really well for organizations that were able, that were able to achieve success with AI capabilities in the pre-chat GPT world was always starting with the business problem first. By grounding your journey first on the business problem, you kind of keep that top of mind and then use a framework where we sort of start creating the different use cases that align that with that business problem. Now, from the content that was shared by Charles, by Sundar, we kind of came across some of the patterns that are already starting to form in the context of generative AI. So the examples were summarization, the blank space problem and coming up with the initial response. And that's where you can kind of start identifying which of these business problems are relevant for your business and which of these patterns align with those business problems. Then by sort of keeping a focal view on the business value that each of these bring in, you can keep your efforts grounded. A key dimension from some of the points that were brought up earlier, you know, how secure is that data going to be? How much can you rely with the generative capabilities of these technologies to come up with answers? Who is going to be the best judge of that? These are all dimensions that you consider as you go through. And then this is a journey that starts from sort of conceptualizing it in the context of your business, piloting it, and then moving out for the rollout at wider scale. So this is something, these are patterns that and lessons that we can learn from just digitization in general, but in particular from what we have learned from the pre chat GPT AI world. Next slide, please. And so in the context of that, right? So there are uh, another key pillar in terms of driving success for you on this journey is by looking at your technology stack. So we saw on the left-hand side, the framework that was used earlier to kind of think about what's the quick fix? How can you get educated about it by just using chat GPT directly all the way up to, you know, using some applications, plugins that are being literally developed in real time to enhance what you can do to get the correct answer, like in the example that we had for the country, all the way up to really sophisticated uses of it. Uh, like that was done by Bloomberg recently, where they use chat GPT to come up with finance related models and customization. So again, starting with that principle, where does your company fall on that spectrum will help guide that answer. And then you bring in additional layers, like what kind of data would the answers generated by a generative AI model suffice based on what's available externally? Can you enrich, can you put in the investments because the returns that you could get from these models uh, justify the effort that's needed to bring in your in-house data? Uh, how would you use it? Are there kind of, where, where does your tech stack currently stand? Where does your data reside? Which cloud are you on? These are all data points that would inform the decision. Lastly, things to consider, you know, for folks who might have had exposure to the world when Linux and open source kind of came about, you need to be really careful about understanding one, how your data would be used by the model that you're using, but also uh, when you use a particular model and you make updates to it, like do you really own the intellectual property for that model? If you are sort of at the uh, lower end of that chart on the left-hand side, we are trying to come up with custom models, but these are all decisions and frameworks that you will have to go through and need inputs for to drive that conversation. Next slide, please. And then lastly, when it comes to the people dimension, you will notice that, you know, uh, in organizations that were successfully able to launch AI products at scale before, there was great collaboration between the business and the technology side of the house. Uh, the two fit hand and glow for success to come, largely because uh, as, as we started out the discussion, the, the business value, the business problem kind of drove the conversation. And through rapid iteration on that journey, the collaboration between the business and the technology teams really drives value and it enables quick iteration. Then there are a bunch of things that you need to kind of think about in terms of you know, who will do what, but also in terms of the capabilities of your organization. When it came to the pre-chat GPT era, it took a few years for the ecosystem to come about to support even some really basic functionalities. Like if you are in software development, you know, versioning, the ability to kind of like have IDs, et cetera, that really exists. So the trend that I'm noticing now when it comes to generative AI, already there's an ecosystem and there are like different components of that ecosystem starting to form to support the 
the generative AI based world. So I think becoming aware of that kind of understanding where do you fit in? What should you do in house? What should you leverage from this ecosystem? And where is it maturing? These are all inputs that could inform that. And by having both business and technology involved, you can you can make better judgments. Next slide, please. So, so to what do you to what extent do you think leaders should be concerned about you know making investments in this technology and it becoming obsolete given how fast it seems like this technology is progressing? I would say that uh, there are many things that leaders can do to to de-risk the concern around uh, obsolescence, kind of thinking like, oh, is it all going to go waste? Partially because at the breakneck speed with which these announcements are coming in, I mean, it's clear there are multiple signals indicating, just look at some of the dimensions, right? You have a bunch of smart researchers attacking the problem because uh, based on the breakthroughs that we have seen, an inflection point has been reached where the general consensus seems to be that this technology is starting to find its legs. Uh, the conversational nature of chat GPT made it you know, more easily understood by lots of people who might not be thinking about AI day to day. But in general, there seems to be consensus that as Sundar mentioned earlier, there are problems, but then there are paths to solving the problem. So I would say that the worry should less be around obsolescence. The worry should be more about you know, ensuring that we just don't get onto a bandwagon because everybody is talking about it. Have a framework to understand where that fits in with respect to your capabilities, the three dimensions that I mentioned earlier. And then keep an eye, sort of have a perspective on how this space is evolving. Get help if you don't have that information uh, within your organization. But as you can see, right, like the trends that are emerging, you have multiple models. There are folks solving different problems. If the models are too big, there are some researchers trying to make the models sparse and smaller. If the compute demands are too large, people are investigating how to kind of reduce that, uh, how to worry about privacy, and then multimodality, right? Like today, I think ChatGPT4 uh, combines image with text. And so you will see these patterns play out, but being grounded in terms of how this brings value to your organization will help you uh, iteratively make decisions that work for you. So do you think this kind of a new paradigm with a co-pilot or an AI is here to stay? And, and, and what do you think it means for the jobs that everyone has within organizations? Uh, I'll answer sort of the portion about the co-pilot, right? So that pattern, just based on sort of seeing early inputs, uh, maybe using examples from say software development. Uh, the early indications seem to suggest that that particular uh, pattern seems to resonate with a lot of people. Now, even though I've been in AI from about 2015 when I started my career in that space in Watson, I sort of have the two you know, opposite thoughts in my mind, right? This always early excitement, and then many times things start hitting a plateau. But based on what I've seen so far, that particular pattern has a lot of promise. Now, what does this mean for our jobs? You know, I think how much scale, how much sort of uh, progress we see will kind of tell that story. I think that is an overarching societal problem if the gains that we see truly scale at that point of time. But as an AI optimist, the way I think about it is there are just so many difficult problems that are out there to solve. So even before we get to that point, we, as the as that Atlantic article points out, there's going to be a lot of work that's going to come our way, and we have an essential tool that can help drive efficiencies while we achieve that. Yeah, Thank, thanks, thanks, Manoj. So uh, I guess some of the takeaways for me from from Manoj is that we really need to think about the particular processes within the business that can be boosted using ChatGPT and other technologies? And what is the potential kind of gain versus the investment in those? Uh, and what are the, the risks looks like? So we're gonna just start kind of jump straight into uh, the last section. So within Prescout, uh, Marianne, Dr. Marianne Krish has been leading efforts to see how Prescout itself can adopt this technology. And we wanted to kind of do this mini case study just to give people a sense of uh, how they might think about this within their organizations. So Marianne, how, how has adoption of ChatGPT been within Prescout and how, how does it compare to the, the rest of the industry? Thanks, you know, 
Uh, yeah, so after the release of ChatGPT, we noticed, of course, a spark of excitement across Scouter. And as soon after the, the release of the, the AI model, uh, we noticed that ChatGPT was already being used by lots of different pockets of employees within the company. As a result of that, we noticed different independent groups started uh, to organize their own initiatives for good practices when using ChatGPT and other related AI tools. And although uh, proactivity is greatly valued within our organization. Pockets of individual initiatives might lead to different views or standards being spread across the company. So one thing we did to avoid those kind of issues was to uniformize ChatGPT use across the, the whole company, the different teams at Prescouter. So we recently defined a working group specifically assigned to investigate and discuss the good practices with the, the use of these and other similar tools. Uh, so this is where we are. We are at Prescada, and we were curious to learn whether other companies experienced a similar timeline with the chat adoption. So we sent out a survey to the participants of today's webinar to learn about their experiences as well. As we can see here in the, the results of the survey, this doesn't seem to be exactly the case uh, within uh, other industries. So about half of the respondents are not currently using ChatGPT for work tasks, and over a third of the respondents uh, use it with minor coordination from their, their institutes. We also identified about 10% of participants discussing the use of chat independently within their companies, and only less than 7% are either at the same stage at Prescouter, so with working groups specifically assigned to discuss and educate the employees, or at a step higher than that with the adoption of measurable goals from the use of the chat. So, so what do you think have been the benefits of uh, creating this working group within Prescouter? So having a working group should serve as a means of having a centralization of the SOPs and good practices to avoid any kind of untrustworthy use of this tool. Uh, and then we can grow our toolbox based on company-wise experiences. So of course, the, sh the, the working group should be, uh, should be receiving constant guidance from C-suite people, but also focusing on educating the, the company employees based on their own uh, experiences with the, with the tool. This seems to be very in line with the overall expectations we notice from the industry. So we can see here on this next survey that uh, most responders agree with this demand for some level of standardization or education with the AI tools within their organizations. So you can see that nine out of 10 respondents believe that the employees should use the chat after some level of coordination or training rather than using it freely within uh, their, their companies. So this is definitely something that employees have a demand for and we've been trying to coordinate at Prescouter. And you know, in terms of creating those SOPs, do you have any kind of broader guidance that you know, other folks might be interested to hear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So based on what Manoj just described, we started by mapping out the use cases within Prescada. So where do, do our employees currently use ChatGPT? What, what are they using for? What specific tests are they using? And then after understanding what are the tests with wider adoption and the tests that are currently under the, the so-called proof of concept phase, we created two working groups within Prescada. So the first working group uh, is looking for how we can use ChatGPT directly. So what are the pros and cons? What are the SOPs and the guidance for, for employees? And then the second working group is looking at building applications for future use. Uh, on our next slide, we can see the SOP that our working group created for, for employees within the company. So the working group is organizing, uh, uh, com compiling the, the different prompts, the, the positive and negative experiences that we gathered so far in the company based on the employee's experience. And so after multiple testing with the different prompts uh, and different prompt styles as well, we identified tests that are highly reliable and tests that are, can effectively help reducing workload from our employees. So here we can see, for example, one, exam uh, one example of high reliability tests that would be translating a sentence from different languages. So we can use these to identify uh, research or resources from uh, different organizations throughout the world and translate those to English so we can use that into our uh, research, research with our partners. So for example, here we can see uh, 
a paragraph that was uh, obtained from a Portuguese website mentioning the extension of expiry date of a vaccine, of a specific vaccine for COVID-19. So this, this is an example of a, a very practical test that is highly reliable uh, and have been shown as a very useful tool for, for our projects. In contrast, our working group also identified unreliable prompts uh, one important example, very important example that we identify is any kind of proprietary technological or scientific resources. As Charlie and Sander explained very well before, ChatGPT is not an expert in any in, in all domains, and the, the chat can recklessly create false or um, unreliable references and websites. So this is something that we rely on our PhD level analysts. To, to do and our working group specifically uh, advises employees to refrain from using ChatGPT for any kind of scientific or technical matters within Prescout. So Thanks. after, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, uh, after learning uh, with this internal evaluation, just wanted to mention that we're not testing also externally using these, this kind of evaluation. So conducting uh, technical diligence and evaluating the different models and how they can respond to different prompts according to specific uses and needs for of our, of our partners. Thanks, Marianne. And I, I like to add that uh, we're building an application uh, to address some of the kind of limitations that we found with the technology and kind of kind of short on time. So I'll just kind of conclude by saying, you know, as you've all, all gathered from what we've covered here, there is a lot of opportunity. There's a lot, a lot of opportunity, but there's also uh, a lot of work. And we've tried to provide a roadmap for how organizations can leverage this technology, find the use cases. Uh, but you know, given that there is kind of some heavy lifting to be done, um, what we would like to say is, you know, we'd love to be part of your conversations, whether you just want to bounce ideas off us at no cost or whether you would like to, you know, help us help have us help you with kind of mapping those use cases, having our prompt engineers formulate those prompts or uh, even taking a look at the the tools we're building to integrate data into ChatGPT. Uh, these are areas that uh, these are actively these are areas that we're actively pursuing, and we'd love to kind of continue the conversation with you on uh, as this technology develops. So uh, we're kind of coming to the end of our time here. Thanks everyone for your attention. Uh, feel free to to reach out. This is an area that we're really passionate about, and we're excited that uh, of where kind of the world is heading and we think this can be a really big kind of career defining moment for kind of many organizations, many individuals in those organizations, as you think about the potential opportunities that uh, kind of this technology presents. So thanks everyone.